So the topic of tonight is a fun one and a controversial one. Put in the chat, please, if you have if you don't know anything about NLP. Let me know in the chat right now. Like, I want to know if we have any NLP newbies in here who just don't know anything about neurolinguistic programming. If you haven't taken a course before, if you haven't done anything, hopefully everyone's at least gone through the free course on our website. If you haven't, you should definitely do that. So Tish has not had anything yet. So Tish, you definitely after tonight probably want to check out our free course on the website. You can just, if you go to nlpca.com, you can sign up for it, go through it. I'll be talking about it briefly, but if you get lost in the context, just reach out and ask questions. But it sounds like everyone else has at least been introduced to NLP in some form or fashion. And if you have been, you know that NLP stands for neurolinguistic programming. It means to reprogram your nervous system through the use of language. And one of kind of the things NLP is known for is being persuasive. So how do you, you know, have more power and more influence? And there are a lot of people that use it in sales and marketing and different things like that. Politicians are known to use it to try and influence people. And so often neurolinguistic programming gets this kind of reputation as being highly manipulative. How many people have heard that before that NLP is manipulative, right? Okay, yeah. And, you know, it is and it isn't. And here's here's the way I'll explain that. And, and it's the reason why the main course that I teach is called How to Read and Lead Others with Integrity, not with sliminess or <laughs> divisiveness or anything like that. Because manipulation means to move with precision and skill. It's your ability to move with excellence. That's what manipulation really is. If you go to a chiropractor, you want them to manipulate your back. If you go to the dentist, you want them to manipulate the cavity out of your tooth as efficiently, effectively, and painlessly, I hope, as possible. Uh, when I had a heart attack in a year and a half ago, I, ha I wanted them to manipulate my arteries to be open again <laughs> so that I could live. So manipulation is not a bad thing. But when we take this, uh, this ability and skill of being able to do something at a very high degree of excellence, and if we put questionable morals and ethics behind it, that is what most of us think of as, as being manipulative, where someone's trying to sell you something you don't really want, or you get you to do something you wouldn't really want to do. And that's not what we're talking about when we talk about influence particularly in the How to Read and Lead course at all, okay? I'm of the belief, so is Tim Halbum and Nick uh, LaForce, my two other kind of main trainers right now. We're of the belief that when you really embody what we call the presuppositions of NLP, and if you take the basic course, Tish, uh, we talk about presuppositions in there, what they are and how they work. And they're kind of filters or way of looking at the world. If you really take them to heart, you are not going to go out and do slimy, manipulative stuff that's going to leave people feeling bad and feeling taken advantage of. What you're going to do is you're going to be more loving to the people that you love. You're going to be more helpful to the people that you want to help. And you're going to be more equipped to make a powerful difference for those who pay you or ask you to help them go from where they are to where they want to be. You're just going to be better at doing that. And that's what we mean when we say how to have more influence and how to be more powerful. So if like if you're a pastor and if you, you know, if you like to go to church, I go to church. And if, you know, if a pastor learns NLP, in my opinion, they'll have the ability to deliver a better, more effective sermon. If you're a therapist and you're helping people resolve trauma and depression and anxiety, you'll be more effective at that. I first was introduced to neurolinguistic programming in my late teens, my freshman year of college, and my stories in the videos in the intro class. But I, I discovered NLP because I was really seriously going to flunk out of college. I had real bad ADD. I had a really hard time learning and absorbing information in kind of the traditional way that's expected in school. 
you know, I was always very creative. I was always, you know, doing things and starting businesses and setting goals for myself. But when it came to like taking books and getting the information out of the books and into my brain and then being able to translate that and pass a test, I really was not very good at that at all. In fact, I got kicked out of Leprechaun books in third grade and I never forgot it. And I think it created some belief that I had some learning limitation. So I had to learn. I had to learn a different way to learn. And what NLP gave me when I first discovered it was it gave me like, like a fresh set, uh, like a fresh start, number one, where it's like I can clean the slate. What if all these stories I have about myself aren't true? I'm a slow learner. I can't, I'm not an athlete. I have no ear for music. I'm not a math guy, so I'll never be good with money or numbers. Like, what if that stuff's not true? So it gave me hope and it kind of cleared the slate. And then through, through the eyes of neurolinguistic programming, it allowed me to go back and look at challenges in a very different way and break them down into small, manageable little steps that I could kind of easily do. And so that's one of the really powerful things that NLP gave me in the very beginning. And I started going through and just challenging all these like limiting kind of beliefs and stories that I had about myself and who I was and what was possible for me in the world. And it changed my world so much, it made me want to share that with others. So I've been really clear on my mission since my early 20s, that is to help others help themselves create a more fulfilling life. The way I do that, I'm not a brain surgeon, that's not my specialty, uh, but my my specialty is people puzzles and helping to get a person from where they are to where they want to be. And I've been doing it for over 23 years full time. I spent 10 years in mental health before that. And I just tell you that to let you know that I've definitely been around the block. I've coached a lot of people. I get I get asked a lot when people call in for like an evaluation for private work. They're like, yeah, well, I see you do a lot of training. Do you do much coaching? Do you actually work with people much? Because quite a few trainers really don't. And I will tell you, that has been my bread and butter for over 23 years. I do more private coaching than I do anything else and I always have. That's why Tim and Chris brought me into NLP Institute of California about seven years ago, because they had seen me working with so many thousands of clients and they referred a bunch of people to me, et cetera. So I love this stuff. I use it every single day. I use it in everything that I do. And what I'm going to introduce those of you who are familiar with NLP to tonight is I'm going to introduce you to something that's not taught anywhere else in NLP. And for those of you who are aware of what meta programs are, okay, raise your hand if you know what, if you've heard the term meta program, meta means above and beyond. So like, you know, NLP is a lot about noticing patterns of thinking and behaving in people and learning how to use those patterns. And that's often why people say we're now more manipulative because we see things other people just don't see. Meta is a set of patterns that are a little bit more abstracted. So it, it's like a pattern about how people think. For example, some people, when they look at something new, they first notice how it's the same, right? How many of you, when you first are introduced to a new idea, a new concept, whether it's a new band or a new movie or a new book or a, or a new something, you first notice how things are the same or the similarities between the two. So like Heidi and a few of the others, right? Now, but some of us naturally, Steve, great, Helen, some of us, when we notice something new, our first thought is, how is it different? What are the differences between the two? And that's called sort by difference. So that's an example of what we call a meta program in NLP. That's not what I'm going to be going over tonight. That is part of how to read and lead that course. It is something that we we go over. Shelly Rose Charvet is known for having some really good stuff on meta programs as well. And there's some, some books and things on meta programs. But meta programs are very what we call contextual, meaning they change depending on the context. So you might be more visually oriented in one domain. Like if I'm speaking in front of a group, I might be very attuned to visually what's going on with the group. But when I'm playing music with my friends, I might be much more tuned into what I'm hearing in my mind's ear and less paying attention to visual. So that's what we mean by contextual. A true personality trait, folks, and I'm going to teach you probably the biggest one tonight. A true personality trait never changes. And there are people that will disagree with me on this, but I'm telling you right now, in my experience of 30 years of working with human beings, 
23 as a full-time professional coach, these do not change and they're never going to change. Now you can balance them out. You can develop them, but they don't change. And the reason I created the course, the reason that I started to model this using NLP is because it is the missing link to getting results with yourself. And it's the missing link to getting results with clients. It will make or break the success of a program, whether I'm helping someone quit smoking, lose weight, build a business, transition in a career, navigate a divorce, heal a trauma, overcome some unwanted habit, you know, find joy in their life. It is the missing link. It will make or break it like in a real way. And I'm going to try and demonstrate that to you tonight. And I'm going to show you how I blend that in with NLP to help people get really good results. First with yourself. Think of the areas, folks. All of you probably have areas where you feel gifted, right? Where you feel in this area, I'm a little bit better than the average bear. I go a little bit faster. Things come easy. I feel like a natural in this area. Everyone's got areas like that, right? At least one or two. Yeah. But also you have areas where it feels like you're banging your head against the wall, right? If we describe it in swimming terms, there's some things that feel like you just kind of glide downstream compared to other people. It's just easy for you. It comes natural. But there's other things where it feels <clears throat> like you're swimming upstream and you're struggling to keep your head above water. Your personality flows like a river throughout your life and it flows in one direction. And when you work with it, things will feel like their flow. You'll feel like you're in flow. Things will feel natural. They'll feel easy. They'll feel attainable. You'll be very hopeful because you will get a lot of feedback that, hey, this is working. But boy, when you go against it and you fight it, it is like swimming upstream. It's exhausting. It's debilitating. It kills the hope. And you often just get fatigued and end up giving up and quitting. And so it's it's that that's why it's such an unbelievably important uh, distinction. And my goal for tonight is to help you all figure out what your main kind of characteristic of it is and then teach you a little bit about it so you can start to use it right away. The other thing is that what I'm going to teach you is also very water cooler friendly. Many of you probably have taken the disc before. So you can put in the chat if you've taken the disc or the Colby or the Enneagram or the Myers-Briggs and things like that. And often the question that people struggle with after getting these assessments is what do I actually do with it? Very few people actually, in my experience, you really use it or find it to be very practical. It's often clunky. It's not what I call like water cooler friendly. And what I want is something that's very water cooler friendly that I can teach clients, they can use it, they can understand, they can relate it, and it makes sense and they can they can put it into their life pretty quickly. So that's what we're going to get at. It's probably worth mentioning real quick, I'm going to show you the NLP map. I'm not going to go through it in any great depth because you can get that in the free intro course. So Tish, hang on, bear with us, but I just want to give some context to where I'm bringing in the personality profile, which is our main focus for tonight. So for those of you who have seen the, the uh, NLP map with me before, you can see it again. If you want this document, you can get a copy of it in the free course um, on the website. So if you just go there, you'll get it there. So I'm going to kind of go through this in hyperspeed here so that we kind of set the stage for what we're going to do. And again, I mentioned earlier, uh, you want to have something to write with, not for now, but when we do an exercise after I go through the map. So in NLP, this is kind of the territory. This is reality. This is, you know, if we had videotape surveillance of what's going on outside of Steve's home or outside of my home, this is what we'd actually catch on video. This would be the data, the pictures, the sounds, the feelings, the taste, the smells. This is what's going down. Depending on which book you read, this comes out of the book Flow by Mahai Chitset Mahai, great book from the early 2000s. Uh, there's about 2 million bits of information we can absorb at any one moment. I know Bruce Lipton gives much different numbers. What's important is the difference between the two, not the actual number, okay? Because who really knows what the real number is? But out of that, they say there's about 134 bits of information we can absorb into our nervous system in any given moment. And the way we absorb information is we take in bits and pieces of info, some data, some pictures, some sounds, things we hear 
So if we see a car wreck, we might see the cars run into one another. We might hear the screeching of the tires. We might smell burning tires or the smell of smoke if the car catches on fire. Taste, if there's taste present or any kind of touch or sensation. And essentially what NLP suggests is that we aren't really responding to all of what's going on out there. We can't really grasp the whole totality of the elephant, so to speak. We're kind of limited to our own limited perspective and our own limited set of data. And we're just getting a little bits and pieces. A good example of this, folks, would be if you have kids. How many people here have more than one child? Right. And, and you know, would you ever just listen to one side of the story when there's an argument between them? No way, because you're only getting part of the story. You're only getting part of the picture. And ideally, you want to get both sides and then have some video of what really happened, because probably none of them are going to be accurate. But what we do is we make these collages in our mind or these maps about what's going on out there in the world. And if you know NLP, you know that we delete tons of information. We distort tons of information. And we generalize tons of information. So if something's not important, our mind just filters it out. You know, I, I never noticed pregnant women, no offense, or children until my wife became pregnant and suddenly I was going to become a dad. Then it was important to me. You know, many people don't notice cars, certain cars, until they buy that car. And then you notice that car everywhere you go. How many people have had that experience before? You buy a car and suddenly you see it everywhere you go, right? Or suddenly you're buying a house or selling a house and you see for sale signs everywhere because now it's on your map. Right? So we delete tons of stuff, we distort, and we generalize. Distortion is really kind of like, it, it gives us a clue to how we make meaning. Because our minds, when something comes in, our mind, to make sense of it, has to go, what is this like that I'm already familiar with? And so it has to do some comparison. And in that comparison, it's bound to distort the information to some extent. I mean, if you've taken my classes, you know, I always talk about the hot, cold thermal coils. There's a museum up in San Francisco, and it's one long pipe. And on one side is a lukewarm coil, and on the other side is a luke cold coil. So like the lukewarm is like bath temperature. You can touch it all day long, no problem. The other side is like mild cold, kind of like refrigerator temperature. You could touch it all day long, no problem, piece of cake. But when these two coils intertwine in the middle and you touch it and you feel them both at the same time, you will rip your hand away and it feels like it's burning. And then you'll check your hand, you go, okay, wow, it's not burning, it's weird. And then you'll touch it a second time and you'll rip your hand away again, but maybe not quite as quick. And by the third or fourth time, you don't rip your hand away. So you might say to yourself, what's going on there? That really gives us a very important clue as to how we make meaning. Because the thing is, lukewarm and luke cold would almost never coexist in a natural environment which means your mind has nothing to compare it to the first time you experience it. And guess what? The first time you experience it, since your mind has nothing to compare it to, what does it do? It assumes it's a threat. This is a really important distinction to get in your mind. When we are unfamiliar with something, when something is new and unfamiliar, because of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, our first order of priority is safety is to protect ourselves. So when our mind comes across something it doesn't understand, its first natural reaction is to be threatened by it. But by time three or four that I grab those thermal coils, my mind goes, oh, this is just like the last time. No big deal. And now it's not threatening anymore. So one of the learnings you can take from that as you start to embark on your journey in NLP is that if something feels scary and threatening, it could just be that it's unfamiliar, like no big deal. How many people were scared the first time they tried driving a car? How many people were nervous about that? I just taught my 16 year old boy how to drive, right? But now it's like, I mean, how, what is it like now? No big deal. You just get in, you go, right? Because it's very familiar. So we're often scared of what we're, you know, not familiar with. I think that's just kind of an important point to, to reiterate there. And so what we're doing folks is we make these collages in our mind. And then what we do is we compare them to other collages we have stored in our mind or other maps we have stored in our mind. And we're going, is this like this time? Nah, I don't know. Is it like this time? I don't know. Is it like this time? Until we get a comparison, our mind goes, yeah, it's just like that time. And until we find that, that, that comparison, until we decide what it's like or what it means, 
Until we know what something means, we have no idea how we're going to feel or how we're going to act in response to it. Imagine for a moment your doctor comes to you and says, you know, hey, your checkup went great. Your physical, everything looked really wonderful, except there was on the lung x-ray, there was a big black mark. Now we just had the machine cleaned, so it could be just dust, but it could be something else. We won't know until we check again. Now you don't know what that black dot means, so you don't know how to feel. If you find out it's just dust, you're probably going to be pretty relieved. If you find out it wasn't dust and it's something serious, you're probably going to be pretty scared. And so we are meaning makers. That is what we do. And we are always making meaning about our experience. And one of the points of neurolinguistic programming is really appreciating the weight of not our experience itself. I mean, obviously that has a huge part to play, but really the meaning we make about our experience. Two people see the same event, they have a totally different response. Some people look at the glass half full, some people look at the glass half empty. And so one of the things to start getting really, really curious about is what is the meaning I'm making about my experience? And what am I doing with that? And so it all comes down to the meaning. And, you know, in the beginning course, I get a lot more into that. You know, in the intro course, I get more into the meaning. I also do this fun experiment to show you how much you delete, distort, and generalize information. So if you haven't gone through that, go through that and pause it. When we get to that little exercise, there's a really cool exercise in there. I just don't want to waste time with, with going through that too much tonight. But it's a really good one. I'll just say that. Okay, now, just to wrap this up, and then I can show you how the personality stuff comes into this. Consciously... And this is according to, there was a paper by a guy by the name of George Miller written in 1957. Noam Chomsky based a lot of his work on that. And he said on our best days, we can track maybe nine things. Most days it's about four or five. You ever wonder why your phone number has a dash every couple of digits, right? Or your social security number has a dash every couple of digits because you wouldn't remember it if it didn't. Our mind can track probably on most days about four or five things at a time. And so one way to start to use that information is to realize that your attention is a lot like a stereo receiver for, for people a little bit more my age and above. And I would say like a web, web address <laughs> or a podcast for people my age or below. And what you tune into, that's what you get. And you get that to the exclusion of everything else. Why? Because you have a limited attention span. If I tune into classical music, folks, I'm going to hear classical music, but I will also hear that to the exclusion of hip hop and country and pop and Western and all the other styles. I'm not going to hear those. I'm going to exclude those. And so a lot of us, unfortunately, have a habit of waking up in the morning and either looking in the mirror, looking at our partner and going, oh God, what do you have to do today? And then we start lamenting on, oh, well, I got to deal with so-and-so. And we start thinking about all the things that we have to do that we don't want to do. And then it feels really awful. And it doesn't feel so good. And so really pay attention to what am I focusing on? And what is the meaning I'm making about it? I'll say one last thing about meaning really quick, because I think it's worth pointing out, and I don't often hear it in other NLP presentations. Meaning has two parts. The top part is the story I tell myself about what this will mean for me in the future. And the bottom part is how, someone mentioned somatics earlier, how I feel about it. How I feel in my body in relation to the story. And you might go, Robert, why are you breaking these two things apart? Well, here's why. The physical sensation, if you remove the meaning and the story the physical sensations you feel when you are scared and when you are excited are almost identical. They're almost completely identical. Think about it. If you're terrified, does your heart rate go up? Yup. Does your blood pressure go up? Yup. Do your palms get sweaty? Probably. Will you feel a little weak around the knees? Most definitely. But what happens if you win the lottery? Is your heart rate going to go up? Is your blood pressure going to go up? <laughs> Probably. Are you going to have a hard time not passing out for the first couple minutes? Probably, but it's like the best news ever versus the worst news ever. And so if if any of you struggle or, or know someone who struggles with anxiety, 
that's something really cool to remember is that like, don't be afraid of what you physically feel in your body. Instead, be really curious about the story you're telling yourself about what it's going to mean for you in the future. Because that's really where the real power lies with that. Okay. All right. So now, how does all this personality stuff that I've been talking about fit into all this? Well, your personality, now personality profile matrix is a term that just really re refers to true personality traits. And there's a, there's a matrix of it. There's a combination of them. I'm going to teach you the main one tonight and help you figure out what that is for yourself so that you, by the end of tonight, you'll be able to use it to make things a little easier and to make things not so difficult and painful. And you should have a little bit less unnecessary human suffering and you should feel a little bit more powerful in your ability to motivate and excite yourself. Okay, you'll know what excites you and you know what stresses you out predictably. So if you have a goal, you'll know how to start to adjust it and look at it in a way where you have less friction and more momentum, which is, I think, what most of us want. And that could be in any realm, if you're communicating with someone you care about, if you're trying to get yourself to do a goal. You could also use this to try and figure out what the number one personal need is of someone you really care about. And if you really love them and you want them to feel really loved by you, you could use this to help them to feel more loved by you. And I can confidently say that because our normal default, you know, if I love someone, my normal default before I learn this stuff is to do what would feel loving to me, right? That's normally what how we're wired, right? It's like, okay, if I feel like, okay, if I love my partner, the loving thing to do is A, B, and C. But really what we're usually working with is what would work for us. And we're not all wired the same. Now, how many people here are in a relationship? I'm currently single. So how many people here? Yeah, most, uh, about half the group. Okay. Now let me ask you this, right? For those of you who are currently in a relationship or have been in a relationship, have you noticed that there's certain things that stress you out that don't seem to stress your partner out? Raise your hand if you've, if you've noticed that experience. Yeah, probably most of us, right? And there's certain things that maybe you know, the, the other way around, maybe they stress them out, but they don't stress you out. Why? We're wired a little bit differently. Okay. So your personality profile matrix will determine how, what information we even allow in and what we keep out. This is why I want to make you aware of this pattern, because until you know it, you wouldn't even consider it. It really determines, and I'm going to prove it to you, that, that it, it completely like prevents certain things from coming in and it pays a strong bias to other things. Your personality also determines how you will put together these collages or maps in your mind that you use for comparison. Guess what it also does? It also determines what you store in your library to use for comparison. And most importantly, it determines your underlying agenda. And one of the things, if you go down this road with me too far, you'll find out is that all of the meaning that you make about your experience has an underlying agenda, a number one priority that is really curated for your survival. In early childhood, I am, I am of the firm belief, and I'll show you what I was looking at here. I'm of the firm belief that this gets wired into your nervous system in early childhood. So most people, when we're talking imprint phase of life, we're talking three to seven or three to 13, depending on which psychologist we're quoting. But it's early childhood. I think we can agree upon that. And in early childhood, every one of us made a decision about something being incredibly important for us to survive and be okay and have the best outcome in life. And that's how your personality got wired in. Some of us just kind of picked it up from caregivers, but there was a decision that was made. Beliefs are like decisions. A decision I make about myself, about what's possible for me in the world, and then I use it to guide my behavior moving forward. And it's our personality that drives that in a huge way. So real quick, I'm going to go over the three biological drives, and then we're all going to go clubbing and help you figure out which personal need is yours. So what do you think is the number one biological goal of your nervous system? Who can tell me? Tish? To protect you. 
to protect you. Mm -hmm. Okay, who else? What's the number one biological goal of your nervous system? I think pr protection tissue is part of it, but it's not the number one goal. Okay, Anas and then Ava. Anas? Uh, it's survival. Survival. And Ava, what were you going to say? Uh, same thing. Yep, survival. The number one biological goal is to stay alive long enough to reproduce and keep life going. Not just survival of you, but survival of the species. That is the number one biological goal of our nervous system. And there's three main biological drives. So if our number one biological goal is to stay alive long enough to survive and keep life going, that requires three biological drives. And these biological drives are always running inside of you and underneath what you're doing like a current. And it's really important to know this as we go into the personalities because it, it's what fuels your personality for sure. The number one is to avoid pain, right? We must, we must all avoid pain long enough to stay alive and fulfill our biological purpose. So we're biologically wired to avoid things that are sharp or painful, like spears and teeth and saber-toothed tigers and things like that. We're designed to survive this paleolithic error where it's feast or famine and survival of the fittest. So our first biological drive is to avoid pain. And as we have matured and as we've evolved, Back then, it was just like physical pain, but now it's physical and emotional pain as well. So it's really what we perceive as painful, which is one of the cool things about NLP, because with NLP, we can change what we perceive as pleasurable or painful by adjusting things in our mind. But our number one drive is to avoid pain. Our second one is to seek pleasure. And there's only two things that bring intense pleasure in a natural environment. Can anyone tell me what they are who hasn't taken the course already? There's only two natural things that in a natural environment that give us intense dopamine. Food and like reproduction. <laughs> yeah, food and sex. And those are the two things that we need to stay alive and keep life going. Those are the two things that give us a natural dopamine cascade. And the third one is the one that's rarely talked about, right? So like in, in like Buddhism, they talk about craving and aversion, pleasure and pain, you know, all this kind of stuff. But the third one I think is really important and it's conserving energy. We must conserve energy long enough to stay alive and fulfill our biological purpose. We have to pace ourselves. If you've ever run a marathon, you realize running a marathon is half running and half managing your resources throughout that run and managing your energy. And so we must conserve energy. And so it often looks like lazy behavior or taking the easy way out. Why is Mrs. Jones or Tom Johnson reaching for the potato chips in the kitchen when he's hungry instead of cooking himself a baked potato? Is it because he's lazy, because he's weak-willed? No, not at all. It's because his nervous system that's de designed to survive was built for an age where he had to run out, grab some berries off a tree, and get back in the cave before the tiger got you. The m most calories for the least amount of effort is a biological win to the body. That's why 7-Eleven is in business, <laughs> okay? Easy calories, very little fiber, so we get a big hit for very little effort. A lot of bang for our buck. It's a biological win. So, you know, realize, you know, this quote, quote, lazy behavior that we have, it's it's survival behavior. That's really what's driving us. So next time you catch yourself taking the easy way out, remember, that's just a sign that that you're a winner. You're, you're still here. Your species survived. Your, your heritage, your breed, your lineage or whatever, you're still here. And so these are always running like currents in our nervous system. We're always looking to avoid anything that's painful or we perceive as painful. We're always chasing anything that's pleasurable or we perceive as pleasurable. This is why people doom scroll Instagram and Facebook when there's really no real benefit. In fact, statistically, it's detrimental to our mental health and emotional welfare. But dopamine, it's like cocaine, dopamine. The reason we chase dopamine is dopamine is the chemical in our brain that signals what we're doing is working, keep going. That's what it's supposed to signal. That's why when you work out, you get a dopamine hit. That's why when you complete a test, you get a dopamine hit. When you graduate from a program, you get a dopamine hit. When you accomplish something, you kill an animal if you, if you eat meat, you know, or you do something that feels constructive, you get a dopamine hit. 
because it's it's a chemical that's supposed to signal what I'm doing is working, keep doing it, and we're gonna everything's gonna be okay. We're gonna survive. Things are going to move forward in life. And so that's why we're always chasing dopamine. So that's why it's also so dangerous when we get these like fast foods and these instant gratification things that give us a dopamine hit, like buying stuff, right? You go out and you buy a new pair of sneakers or a, a, a new motorcycle, guys, or you know a new purse, you get a dopamine hit that makes you feel like something's happening when in reality, you might be taking a step backwards. And unfortunately, modern marketing knows this and takes advantage of this. So that's what's driving us. And so your personality is your best attempt at getting the most pleasure, avoiding the most pain, and taking the easy way out. So whatever your number one personality trait is that you leave here with tonight, you chose that because you believed ultimately that would give you the most pleasure, help you avoid the most pain, and help you take the easy way out. So with that said, let's go clubbing. Now I've got five friends and we they're all wired a little bit differently and we wanna convince them to go clubbing with us. And so as I'm describing these five friends, I want you to think about which two resonate with you the strongest and the most. You have all five of these in you, I guarantee it. So all five of these are running in you folks, but I want you to think about which two feel the strongest in you as we go through it. And this is definitely the part where if you can turn on your camera, you definitely wanna do it. As an NLP trainer, I am trained to notice Pupil dilation, which granted is a little bit harder on Zoom with like, you know, 30 people or something. Facial expressions, facial tonus, color changes. Uh, Vicky's very gifted to NLP as well. So is Heidi. So is Randall. Several people. So is Ava. Several people on here I know have done a lot of training with me and Tim and Nick over the years. And we're designed to notice this kind of stuff. And it helps us to be a bit more thoughtful and notice what's working and not working with people when we're talking with them. And if you learn NLP, it's something that you can learn very easily. So I'm gonna describe these five friends and just think about which two resonate with you the most. So our first friend is Frank. And Frank is a freedom guy. Frank wants to do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. He doesn't wanna be told otherwise. He loves options, adventure, and upside potential. And he hates feeling restricted, limited, and controlled. Don't tell Frank what to do. He'll probably do the exact opposite. So how do we motivate Frank to wanna to go out with us tonight? Let's consider two options. Option one, as I tell Frank, hey, listen, Frank, we're going to go out to this country Western bar in the middle of nowhere. It's the only thing there. So if it doesn't work out, it'll probably be like, that's it for the night. They close early. They only serve beer. They only play Shania Twain. They only do country line dancing. And if that's a bus, that's it for the night. Do you think Frank's excited about that idea, folks? Yeah. Thumbs up or thumbs down. I think we got a lot of thumbs down on that one, right? But let's say we tell Frank, hey, look, Frank, the jet's fueled up. All you got to do is pack a duffel bag, meet us at the airport. We're going to Vegas. We got a limo driver to take us to any club. We have VIP backstage passes to every club in town all night long. 50K in poker chips. Sky's the limit. He is all over the Vegas option. Does that make sense? Because that's how Frank's wired. That's what he wants. So that's Frank. That's the freedom guy. So that's our first one, folks. Now, our second friend is Sally. And Sally is security-minded. Now, this Sally, being a security-minded person, she loves to feel assurance. She loves to feel safe. She wants to know what's going to happen next, who it's going to happen with, how long is it going to last, when's it going to end, how much does it cost, how much does it weigh, who's going to be there. She loves to know that because she doesn't like surprises. She doesn't like risk. She doesn't like chaos. She doesn't like uncertainty. So she would rather have a very carefully written out itinerary of exactly what we're going to do and who we're going to do it with and how long it's going to last and when it's going to end in order for her to feel comfortable. Now realize folks, Sally may ask the same question as Frank, where are we going? But can you already see how Sally is going to delete, distort, and generalize for a very different set of criteria than Frank? Frank wants to know, is this going to be an adventure or is it going to suck? Is it going to give me lots of options or is it going to be restricting? But Sally's thinking in a very different way. She wants to know more, is it going to be safe or not safe? And so if we tell Sally, well, listen, it is in the worst part of town and there will be gang activity there. So don't wear red, don't wear blue, don't bring your expensive purse, stay close to the group, but the DJ is amazing. You're going to love it. Do you think she wants to go? 
No way. <laughs> but if we tell Sally, listen, Sally, we're going to go to the top of the market, the Mark Hopkins Hotel. It's in Knob Hill, very safe part of San Francisco. They have valet parking, so the car will be nice and safe. They have a high cover chart to keep the riff raft out, but there's no financial risk because we know the Mater D. We have a corner table reserved. There's going to be a jazz quartet. And Mike and Tracy are going to join us, two people you know and feel very comfortable with. And we're going to be there for exactly one hour. We're each going to have one cocktail, and then we're going to leave. And the designated driver will not be drinking. Do you think that works for Sally? Yeah, totally fits her personality, right? Now, Frank wouldn't like that, but Sally would love that. So that's Sally. That's person number two. She's security, okay? So we've covered freedom and security. So let's go to our next friend. Our next friend is Bob. And by the way, all of these people that I'm mentioning are real people, real clients. I have permission to use their names with the exception of the last one. And it will be evident when we get there. The last one is, of course, an amalgam and the name isn't real. But the next guy is Bob. And Bob is belonging. He loves to be included. He loves to be part of a group. He believes there's strength in numbers. He loves to be part of a team. He loves to wear his San Francisco Giants gear on game day, his 49ers gear on game day. And he wants to be included and loved and part of. And his biggest fear in life is feeling excluded, unloved, or rejected. So with the exception, if you've been in the class, don't try not to answer this. But I want to know, for those of you who haven't been in the class with me before, what is the question that you think is on Bob's mind? When we bring up this idea of going out, uh, Dr. Mary or Marley? Who else is going to be there? Who's going to be there? That's exactly it. That's all Bob wants to know. He doesn't care if we're going to the country western bar or if we're going to the top of the mark. He wants to know who's going to be there. Now, if we tell Bob, well, actually, everyone we know is going to be over at this other place. But me and Dr. Marley are going to go to this Hells Angels biker bar down the road there where we're definitely not going to fit in. We're definitely not going to be welcome. But the guitar player is off the hook. Bob doesn't want to go. He wants to go where everyone's going to be. He wants to be with the group. He wants to be with his people. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. We got two more to cover here, folks. Our next friend is Cecil. And Cecil is competency-based. Cecil likes to be competent. He likes to be smart. He likes to set a goal and accomplish it. He likes to take on a challenge and make it happen. He likes to be the go-to guy. He loves, he looks at a mountain and he wonders how long it will take him to climb it. And Cecil loves to bring value anywhere he goes. He loves to solve the problem, save the day, be the hero and bring value. And what always and predictably causes stress to Cecil is feeling disrespected, feeling unappreciated, or feeling incompetent. That is the most painful stab in the back in the world for Cecil. And so if we tell Cecil, look, Cecil, you know, of course, he'll ask us also, where are we going to go? But in his mind, he already believes he could come up with a better answer given the criteria than we probably could. But he'll humor us and he'll ask us nonetheless. Now, by the way, none of these personality traits are any better than the other. And remember, you have all five. You just want to figure out which one's dominant. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Because one thing I will tell you right now is your number one is the number one criteria for every decision you've ever made about yourself. This is one of the reasons you want to know this stuff. If freedom is number one, freedom's your deal breaker, folks. Anything that makes you feel like you're going to lose your freedom, you will say no to or you will sabotage. So if you want to understand why you're sabotaging yourself, why you are feeling resistant, why you're not following through with your goals, this is one of the first places to look is your personal needs because it will determine how you make decisions. If I ask you about your car, folks, I can read you because you chose your car unless it was given to you. You chose it based on your personal needs, guaranteed, like the outfit you're wearing, same thing. Your partner, your partner, same thing. Don't take my word for it now, but trust me, this is going to pan out. Okay, so if we tell Cecil, look, Cecil, we're just going to go to the Irish bar on the corner. Don't wear your suit. Everyone will think you're a limo driver. Don't use your $10 words. No one knows what they are there, Cecil. No one cares. All they care about is can you drink beer, play pool, and fight? All three of which he's lousy at. Does he want to go? No way, because no one will respect him. No one cares. 
he will feel totally incompetent there. And if you're competency-based, you can't relax unless you feel you're bringing value to whatever group you're part of. Just, it won't work. Belonging people can go in any room and go, who's going to be my new best friend? Competency-based people cannot do that. If they don't feel like they're bringing extreme value that can't be gotten otherwise, it's very hard for them to relax and have a good time. Now, if we tell Cecil, listen, Cecil, I'm going to tell you something in confidence. Vicky and I have a colleague, we'll say, in the Department of Defense. There's a situation going on in the Middle East. We'd like to fly you to the Pentagon for a private meeting. We know you have specialty knowledge of silicon chips and wafers, and your knowledge could save the world from a possible third world war. Can we count on you? <laughs> the plane leaves in an hour. Can you see how Cecil could not resist the urge to pack his bags and get on that plane? Suddenly he can save the day. Suddenly he can have great tremendous value, which will garner great respect and validation and appreciation of others. This is what Cecil lives for. Does this make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Now let's go to our last friend. Our last friend is Dwayne. But don't you dare try to write down Dwayne's name, folks. None of you will ever get it right because he doesn't spell it like it sounds. He uses some weird symbol like a dollar sign or an asterisk. And it's the weirder, the better, because Dwayne, no matter what you're doing, has to show you how he's different and unique and special. Because Dwayne is self-expressive, and the self-expressive person has to be unique, special, and different. That is what they live for. That is how they feel they deserve a seat at the table of life. Think of the tortured artist. This is Dwayne. And the biggest fear in someone like Dwayne is just being average, ordinary, or irrelevant. That's his biggest fear. So if we tell Dwayne, he'll ask, of course, where we're going to go. If we say, hey, look, we're just going to go to Applebee's for happy hour. They have half off chicken wings <laughs> and cheap beer. Do you think that sounds interesting to him? No way. Because there's nothing special about it at all. It would make him feel average, ordinary, and irrelevant, which in his nervous system, realize, feels like death. Realize, folks, for all of these five personal needs, the freedom person, you take away their freedom, it feels like they're going to die. The security person, you take away their security, they feel like they're going to die. The belonging person, you make them feel rejected and excluded and unloved, they feel like they're going to die. Because these needs are what we need in order to survive and thrive and be okay in the world. It's what our nervous system believes we need to be okay. And so Dwayne believes he needs to be unique and special in order to have any value and, in essence, to survive. So if we told Dwayne, actually, look, Dwayne, there's an underground DJ flying in from Germany at 3 a.m. He's not even hit the States yet, but he'll be he'll be in Rolling Stone probably in six months. By then, of course, we'll be over it. Um, there's going to be a midget in this alley. You're going to go down this alley, give him this gold coin. You're going to go down a manhole, and there's going to be an underground rave that's going to be just unbelievably off the hook. The more weird, the more out there, the more Dwayne is into it. Does this make sense? Because it adds to his unique persona. And I've seen clients over the years, folks, in all like extreme versions in all of these domains. And of course, we all have a mixture of them. Okay. So we've covered these domains. We've got freedom, security, belonging, competency, and self-expressive. And so I invite you to start to consider now which two feel the strongest in you. Which two feel the strongest in you? And if you want, you can put them in the chat. And there's one exercise I really kind of meant to do before. And that exercise is called the highs and the lows. But I'll tell you what it is. If you think about three events, take a moment. This is what I want you to write down. Think about three events that were frustrating or upsetting to you. You don't have to share them with anyone. I'm not going to ask you to do that if you don't want to. But think about three events that were frustrating or upsetting to you. Write them down. Doesn't matter if it happened yesterday or when you were three. Three events that were upsetting or frustrating to you and why? Why were they upsetting? 
What about them bothered you? What about them upset you? Take a couple minutes and do that. And then the next question I'm going to ask, and I'll put both these questions in the chat here. I'm only going to ask you two. The other question is, what were three events that were exciting or uplifting to you? And why? So make sure you do the ones that were upsetting and frustrating first. So we end on a good note. Three events that were frustrating or upsetting. And three events that were exciting or uplifting. And why? And here's what you're going to find. When you get in and dig into the why the three events were frustrating or upsetting, it's going to match the key stressors of your number one and possibly your number two personal need. Who has one that they're willing to share with the group, just so I can demonstrate how this equals out? Does anyone have one they're willing to share? Some event that was really frustrating or upsetting to you? I know it's kind of a personal question, but Vicki, yeah, could you share one? Thank you. Yeah. Um, talking to somebody who was talking down to me and, oh. and actually um, had no expertise in the area that I was talking about, but talked to me as if I didn't know what I was talking about. And pissed me off. How many people can relate to that one? Feeling like someone's talking down to you. And especially it's even worse if they if you feel like they don't know what they're talking about and it pissed you off. What about that bothered you? I felt disrespected. That's right. Yeah. So which personal need does that sound like, folks? <laughs> well, <laughs> competency. Competency. Do you yeah. see how that fits? The biggest stressor of your competency is feeling disrespected, unappreciated, or incompetent. If you're competency-based folks, and a lot of people that are interested in NLP have a strong competency part of their nervous system. Mm -hmm. If you are, the only thing worse than having someone talk down to you is talking down to you in front of other people whom you respect. Yeah. That's 10 times worse. or telling you that you did something wrong. It's 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 like a knife in the back. But if you're belonging, the worst feeling in the world is being excluded, feeling unloved. It's not getting invited to the party. That's what bothers the belonging person, not, not getting passed up for the promotion. Hey, they're a team player. Only one person can get promoted. But if you don't invite them to the picnic or the party, it's crushing to them. So just to give you an example of how this plays out, if you are competency-based and you are in a relationship with someone you really care about and you really love, if you're really honest with yourself, I would bet you've had the experience of really pissing off your partner at some point because you felt disrespected by them. And so you let them have it. And in that moment, if you're honest with yourself, what you'll see is the truth is that for you, being respected was more important than being liked. And so it won out and it took precedent. Now, if you're lucky and your partner's belonging, they'll let you win. They'll let you take one for the team because for them, the relationship is more important than winning. But boy, if your partner's also competency-based, it's like two rams button heads. And you'll try to one-up one another and get into these kind of different debates and things like this. And so when we assess what your number one and your number two is, or if I do that with a client, then it lets me know these are the areas that are always going to excite, entice, and motivate them to jump and take action. If I take whatever that goal is that they want and I show them how it will help them get their key attractors. So if they're competency, if I show them how it will help them feel validated, accomplished, valuable, smart, important, they're, they're like, it's like rocket fuel. 
But I also know that I have to be very careful to approach them in a way where they don't feel disrespected, unappreciated, or incompetent. So I want to celebrate their successes and things like that. So like a great example would be, I've worked with a couple professional golfers over the years. One one guy was Sam Chavez, who was, um, he was ranked 27th in California when I started working with him in high school. And he beat the number one ranked kid in the country after three months of coaching. He later on became a professional golfer. But professional golfers are a great example of highly competency-based people. And so it's it's their greatest ally and their biggest Achilles heel all at the same time. Because the ultimate in golfing, you know, when you're in, when you are winning a tournament, you're playing against the best players. They're on the tee with you going hole to hole and they're watching you. So when you win in front of them, and they all know that you're the you're the guy or you're the gal and you're better than the rest of them. It's like the highest high. But can you imagine how it feels when they lose? It's devastating. It's the lowest low. So they get in their head a lot and it really, really trips them up. So it's 608. I'm going to transition here in a moment to talk about how to read and lead for those of you who want to stay and find out more about that program because this is just one little layer that we cover, but it's one of the ways in which I can help you very quickly in, in eight sessions together, really first understand yourself better and know how to motivate yourself, how to get unstuck, how to not sabotage, how to make sure that you're on point and follow through the way you want. But even more importantly, I think is also learning how to see it and then do that with others. And it doesn't require that someone takes a test. You can do it on site and validate it through conversation. So in that course, I actually show you a slideshow of people and have you read them on site and validate through conversation. You'd be surprised how easy it is. But boy, if you really want to have another human being felt understood and appreciated and loved and cared for, and you can see these differences, can you see how it would make your ability to do that way more powerful? Like in a huge way. If I have two people that come in, let's say for a weight loss program, just a weight loss program, and one's security and one's self-expressive, realize what works great for one will absolutely bomb for the other. The security person wants to know that the program is tried, it's tested, it's validated. It's the same program we've done for the last thousand people. You will get the same quality, the same program, the same steps. And the more you tell them that, the better they feel. But what do you think happens if we tell that same thing to someone who's self-expressive. They instantly go, there's no way this could work for me. <laughs> It'll never work. And if we tell the security-based person that's totally customized from person to person, it'll stress them out. And these are the things you want to know ahead of time. We can also use this to predict ahead of time where a person will have difficulty. Someone whose security, for example, will always seem like the best student or the best coaching client in the beginning. Because if you say, listen, there's a 300 page manual with my program and I need you to read every page of it, they'll do it. They will appear to be the best client in the beginning. They will read every page, they'll highlight it, they'll have questions, they'll bookmark it, they'll do all of that. But you gotta realize if you're working with a client who's security based, you need to adjust their expectations on day one when they're still feeling good, when they're still hopeful, when they're still positive, because that's how they set themselves up. And if you know this stuff, you can see it ahead of time. How many people here really relate to security as being one of your strong ones? I'm not gonna embarrass anyone or anything like that, but does anyone, can anyone relate to security being pretty strong in them? If you are, you might not wanna admit it, okay? So I'll just say, for those of you who think you are, Tell me if this sounds familiar or just find out for yourself if it sounds, thank you, Judith. <laughs> so if you are security-based and I come in and say, boy, 90% of your program's going great. Now, how many people are freedom-based for sure? Raise your hand if you think you're freedom-based, right? So like if you're in a program, I go, hey, 90% of your program's going great and you're freedom-based, you're probably gonna go, man, I, I'm going out for, like if it's a weight loss program, I'm going out for margaritas and guacamole tonight. I got room to spare. I'm doing great. Things are great. I'm, I'm on track. But if you're security-based and I go, 90% of your program's going great, you should be really happy. You're probably thinking, uh-oh, what's up with the 10%? I better clear my schedule. I got to get on this. I got to stay ahead of this. 
I got to really focus down and get on that 10% and figure out what's going on wrong. Because if I don't, it's going to be a train wreck. And then if you're security-based, what'll happen is you'll focus in more and more on that 10%. And if you're not careful, you get so focused on the details and what's not quite right, what's not quite perfect, you'll lose perspective and suddenly you'll feel overwhelmed and it'll feel like nothing's working. And one of the telltale signs of that is you'll then start to see your success as black and white or pass fail. And when that happens, check out City. You'll probably go very shortly into what we call the derail and bail. So when I know I have a, a client who's a little bit higher on the security scale coming in, I have to adjust their expectations on day one. I have to tell them metaphors like, let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen a baby jump out of a crib and dance the ballet? Right? Has anyone ever seen that? No. Why? Because that's not how we learn. We learn by making mistakes. I had a mentor tell me years ago, all things that are perfect are dead. If it's perfect, it can't be improved upon. It can't be changed. All things that are living are in a constant state of change, right? 100,000 cells a minute changing over, things like that. And so if you really think about how you learned everything, you learned it by making lots of mistakes. For those of you who are parents, moms and dads, think about your babies, how they learn to walk. Got to learn head control. That's that first thing, right? And then there's the army crawl. And then there's the drunken sailor going from one piece of furniture to the next. Then there's the top heavy toddler. And then eventually they learn to run. And some of them eventually learn to dance. And even some fewer of them eventually learn to do the ballet. But we only learn through making lots and lots of mistakes. So there's all these metaphors I'll start to layer in for the different personalities to help adjust the goals as we're going along. And if you can see these personality traits and people, you know exactly how to adjust the goal so that you minimize the resistance and you maximize the momentum as they're traveling from A to B, because any journey is going to be a series of smaller goals. And so it's really important that they understand that. The other way it's really important is that it's the only way you can get your ego out of the way. You know, if you're competency-based, you have a need for people to know how smart you are and how competent you are. And sometimes that gets in the way of doing what's right or doing what's in best service of like your kids or your husband or your wife or your family or your clients or what have you. And so, you know, this system can also help you when you get to a fork in the road, know what's truly in your best interest, what's truly going to bring you the fulfillment and the joy you're looking for and not just be in service of your ego, which is, is often referred to in spiritual terms as a hungry ghost, right? The term hungry ghost is a big ghost with a big, big belly and a tiny little mouth. And no matter how much you feed it, it's never satisfied. If you're competency-based, folks, no matter how much you accomplish, it'll never, ever be enough. Just look at all the things you've told yourself over your life that once I do that, then I'll be able to relax. Once I get that done, then I'll be, then I'll well have arrived. How many people have had that experience where they're like, if I just get that next goal, then it'll all be good. And the minute you're there, your mind's already on the next one. It, there's never enough. You just can never, ever satisfy it. So I hope this was helpful. I hope this gave you a little bit of understanding. We've gone over the five personal needs, freedom, security, belonging, competency, and self-expressive. And each one of those has key attractors and key stressors. I encourage you to do that experiment. What are three events that were frustrating or upsetting and why? and then see which one of those buckets they line up with the most. That's probably your number one. And the second one lines up most, probably your number two. And then take a look at the three events. So the ones that are frustrating, upsetting, the ones that are exciting, uplifting, and then why. And that'll help you figure it out. And if you have questions, reach out to me and do that. I'm also opening up the office hours, usually on Mondays. I don't tend to open it up on Thursdays. But if you're in the, if you take the free course, there's a free group in there. You can ask questions in the group. You can privately message me. And for those of you who are interested in the class, that class can be found on our website. I'll show you where to go. You go to our website and you go to training. It's the first class here. And it's starting November 12th. And it's eight weeks. So I will stay on. Anyone who's got questions about the class or about anything that we covered, I'll stay on for a few more minutes till about 6.30 and answer questions. We have lots of case studies on there. So it's just lots of information. There's videos on there. There's a breakdown of all the modules. 
and everything. I tried to answer all the questions you could possibly have. So that's called How to Read and Lead Yourself and Others with Integrity. So with that said, I'm going to open it up to questions. And you can have questions about the program or questions about what we've covered. Hopefully you found this really valuable. And again, please send me feedback and let me know what you liked, what you didn't like, what you'd like more of, what you'd like less of. And I will take that feedback to heart for next month's masterclass. So any questions, if you have them, ask now. Otherwise, I'm going to shut this down in a few minutes and head to the gym. Great to see you, Ava. It's been a little while. You should come back to office hours. I think I might have scared you away a little bit on office hours. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Tuesdays and Thursdays, you'd be more than welcome to come back and hang out with us. Have you noticed, um, is there a more people tend to be one of those things or they're pretty evenly spread? <clears throat> That's a great question. In certain contexts, you'll see more or less. So for example, if we went to an art show, if we went to Art Basel, for those of you who know Art Basel, or we went to a fashion show, the Met Gala, do you think we'd see a higher skew of self-expressive people? You betcha. <laughs> Okay. If we went to, let's say, a, a team sports type event, do you think we might see more belonging people? Probably. But we'll see a mixture of people wherever we go. If you go into more TED talks, things like that, you know, TED conferences or NLP trainings, you might see a few more competency based people than other places. But one of the things I really love about, about, teaching and training neuro linguistic programming and working with coaching clients is we get people from all walks of life, from all parts of the world now that we're online and all walks of life. And I love that diversity. Like one of my personal criteria for, for coaching over the years is I know I'm doing my coaching right when my coaching clientele list is very diverse. Lots of men and lots of women and from lots of different stations in life and lots of different places in the world. And the more diverse it is, the better I feel because it lets me know that I'm resonating to a better audience. If I just got like one demographic, that would be a little bit concerning for me personally. Mm -hmm. Shows you as a freedom person. <laughs> <laughs> and competency. Because I feel if you're really good one. at it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm freedom and competency. So I feel like if you're if you're really good at what you're doing, you should be able to communicate with with a, a diverse group pretty well. Yeah. So, other questions, or does anyone else want to check their read? You know, if you think you know what you are and you want to throw it out there, I can ask you a few questions and maybe help you narrow it down to your number one, your number two. Otherwise, you can just notice, just notice. If when people talk to, if you listen to the people you're you're talking with, if, notice if you're hanging out with people and you get them talking, people will always eventually talk about things they love and things they hate. And so if someone says they like something, say, well, what do you like about it? And then listen. Listen for for the personal needs. Or if they say, Oh, I don't like that. Oh, okay. Interesting. What don't you like about it? If you like someone's car, you say, Oh, I really like your car. How did you choose that? And if they're competency based, they'll tell you what a smart decision it was. But if they're self-expressive, they'll tell you how unique it is and how different it is. If they're belonging, they might talk about how it's a really, it's the most popular car of 2024. And, you know, it's highly rated in Consumer Reports because AKA everyone's got it. If they're security, they might tell you they got a Volvo because it's the safest car on the road, which Tesla now rivals, but depending on who you ask. And so like you can, you'll start to hear it in every thing people talk about. Oh, you brought potato salad to the picnic. Why did you choose that? Oh, let me tell you. And just listen and boom, it just oozes out. And once you know that, if you really want to press a happy button in someone to make them feel great about themselves, now you know how to do it. If I have a belonging employee or a friend and I want them to feel really great about themselves, me telling them how smart they are and, and what a great decision they made isn't going to do it. But if I tell them how much we love having them around, how we couldn't imagine having a party or going on a vacation without them and how their presence just always brings warmth and joy to the room. It's mind blowing to them. But if you're competency based and I tell you how valuable you are to the company and we cannot live without you 
And that one thing you did last year saved the company. If I can do that legit, of course, you don't do it if it's not legitimate. But again, there's so much experience to be had out there. We can always find the things that do authentically line up. I say, you know, one of the things you bring to the team that's really no one else can do, you you know, is A, B, and C, and boom, they light up. Or if I have a self-expressive person on a team, we say, listen, we need you to do this next thing because you know what? You're the only one who can think outside the box on this and bring a fresh perspective because we just can't seem to get it. But we know you always will bring a different viewpoint. We really, we really appreciate that. It also, if you're managing a group of people, you can use it to really quickly assess where people can play to their strengths and be the most successful within their team as well. All right, folks, I want to honor my agreement to end on time. So I'm going to end it here unless there's any other questions. I appreciate you all being here for this first inaugural masterclass. I hope you found it valuable and we'll hope to see you on the next one. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody. Take care.